Money Pit is presented by DAP Spray Texture and Dice Coatings. Now here are Tom and Leslie. Coast to coast and floorboards to shingles, this is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. It's my favorite time of year. It's fall. It's the Goldilocks season. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. So if you've got a project that you want to get done around your house, you are in the right place because we are here to help you do just that. Reach out to us with your questions, your comments, your issues. If you need a little bit of direction on how to get started with a project, if you're stuck in the middle or you need some advice on what to do, all great reasons to reach out to us. Two ways to do that, go to moneypit.com slash ask. Click the blue microphone button. You can record your message right into your iPhone or your Android or whatever device you have, or you can call us at one eight 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 Money Pit. That's 888-666-3974. Coming up on today's episode, fall is a great time for some really big planting and patio projects like building rock gardens and paver patios and fire pits and laying new sod or even planting trees. So we're going to have tips on how to get those fall projects done. And according to the FBI, most burglaries involve criminals forcibly breaking into your home. Well, Consumer Reports have been testing door locks, and they just released some new ratings. We're going to share the best and the worst ones that you can buy. And you love the classic look of marble tops in your kitchen or bath, but not the high costs. We're going to share a new product that provides a beautiful marble surface without that usual expense. But before we do that, we're here for you. So let us know what you need help with. Is it a renovation, a repair, a decorating project? We'll reach out because we've got the tips, the ideas, and the inspiration that are going to help you avoid all of that home improvement perspiration when it comes to fixing up your spaces. So let's get to it. The number here is one eight 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 Money Pit eight 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 six 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 three nine seven four. Or again, for the fastest possible response, go to moneypit.com slash ask. Ed and I was on the line with a heating and cooling question. What can we help you with today? I've got a home that uh, it's a ranch style on the basement, about 3,000 square feet. And probably half of the upstairs, the living room and the kitchen and dining room, is cathedral ceiling. That part of the house seems to stay about 10, 10 to 15 degrees warmer than uh, the rest of the house. Um, it's I've had the AC checked, and they say the size is adequate. But I was wondering, if there, is it insulation problem, and is there a way to correct that? Well, it's basically heat loss. And, yes, whenever you have a cathedral ceiling, you can't get as much insulation in that ceiling structure. And because heat rises and you've got that ceiling up there, you're going to have a warmer second floor. So how do you combat that? Well, there's a couple of things. One of which is, do you have ceiling fans up there? Yes. Right, and the ceiling fans are not helping. Are they pushing that warm air down so that uh, it can be cooled in the summer? It, it helps, but it's not enough. One of the things you might want to do is considering supplementing the second floor with a split ductless system or a mini split ductless. It's usually easier to do that than to overrun the air con- the main air conditioner to get the second floor cooler. And in the long run, you'll use less energy that way. Sometimes, in, in a, in, depending on the home design, you're going to get a warm area of the house that just can't get enough air delivered to it because of its design. You know, in, in my home, I've got a, an office on the west side of the house, and it just happens to be pretty far from where the air handler is, and so it always stays a bit warmer. And I put a split ductless system in there just to kind of supplement the central air. We still have central air in the same space, but the split ductless supplements it quite nicely and does a really good job of keeping it very cool and comfortable uh, in those warmest summer days. So I would suggest you consider that as an option here. Okay. Now, would it help to put a like a power vent in the seat and the roof? No, because you don't have an attic. You have an attic. You have a cathedral, so there's no attic space there. Plus. Those uh, exhaust, those attic exhaust fans typically take as much air conditioned air out of the house as they do hot air because they depressurize the attic so much that they tend to draw it down into the house and steal some air conditioned air at the same time. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right, Ed. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Now we're going over to Alaska where Mary has a question about siding. How can we help you today? We recently sited our house with concrete siding underneath is plywood and then Tyvek. We use 4 by 12 panels that are pre-painted. They're attached to the plywood walls. Okay. My question is, do I need to caulk where the batten attaches to the panels? 
And secondly, do I need to caulk the nail holes on the batten? Well, you wouldn't caulk with the batten attaches to the panels. You might use an adhesive in that area if that's recommended by the siding manufacturer. Uh, in terms of the nail holes, generally you don't have to caulk nail holes. You know, as long as you're not smashing the nails in and breaking the siding, they're usually tight enough around them where you do not have to caulk each individual nail head. The nail holes have broken through the painted surface. So if they broke through the painted surface, it's not a bad idea to touch them up with a little bit of caulk, but I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Mary. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Pet. Adam in Rhode Island is on the line with a leaky skylight. What's going on? I have a bay window in my bedroom and it's below a skylight. And for a while, it started to create those brown stains on my ceiling. But for the most part, the biggest problem was there was a leak in the bay window. Mm-hmm. So my uh, my father and I went up there. We put a new flashing kit on the, uh, the skylight. And it seemed to help the problem, but it did not eliminate the problem. And I had a contractor friend over who took a look at it as well. And he noticed that if you go out on the outside, the bay window abuts the gutter where the gutter attaches to the the roof above it and it's his opinion that there should be perhaps some like six to eight inch gap there between where the gutter meets the house and where the bay window starts so it's his opinion that the bay window might have been improperly installed so it sounds like the bay window is up too high is that what you're saying so it basically goes right up under the gutter right it's certainly there's certainly no separation between um the soffit uh, but there's also no separation from where the gutter meets the house either. All right. And does the bay window have its own roof on it, or is the roof sort of built into the soffit structure? No, it's, it's under the overhang. Oh, it is under the overhang. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is it possible that the gutter is um, overfilling and perhaps the water's backing up through the gutter, getting into the soffit and running into the bay? I, I thought that at one point, um, and I have gone up and checked, and the gutters are clean. Okay. And where this is on the roof, is there sort of a long stretch of roof that goes down before the before it hits the skylight. Um, yeah, I guess. Oh, maybe uh, ten or ten or fifteen feet. So I'm going to give you um, a trick of the trade, and this might solve it. You might be getting so much water against that flash against that uh, skylight that it's just sort of forcing its way in. One thing you might want to do is to try to put a diverter on the roof right above the skylight, and this see if this works. It's really easy to do, and so there's kind of no reason not to try it. But you make, um, a, you take a, a piece of aluminum sh- in the shape of an L, and you basically attach it to the roof, and you essentially want to intercept that flow of water down the roof and have it run around the skylight and around the bay window. So you're slowing the volume of water that's coming down that roof, you know, running full steam towards that skylight in that bay window area and running it around that space. And all you got to do is, is is tack that onto the roofing shingles, put some silicone caulk to help seal the edge, and see what happens. So you caulk you caulk the edge of the L with with silicone, and how do you affix the uh, aluminum to the? Roof? Yeah, you could use you could simply nail through the shingle. Okay. And with a, like a roofing nail, because you're but with the caulk will help seal it. And basically, you're you're capturing that water as it's running down the roof, and it's sort of running right around that skylight, bay window, roof combination, and then off to the gutter. All right, sounds good. I'm willing to try it. Good luck, Adam. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. This episode is brought to you by Pete's. Few things start your day better than a good coffee. That's why Pete's hand roast their coffee from a specific selection of high-quality beans. And they don't just put those beans into anyone's hands. Pete's trains their roasters for 10,000 hours so they can master the roast that gives you the most. Pete's Coffee. Coffee for coffee people. Find Pete's online or at your local retailer. Hey guys, if you've heard a helpful tip or two while listening to our show, please help us help even more home improvers by dropping us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That would be awesome, and you might even win a copy of our book, My Home, My Money Pit, your guide to every home improvement adventure. Just go to moneypit.com slash review. Susan in Texas has some concrete that's cracking up. Tell us what's going on. Yes, I have a curve out front of a 1955-year-old home, okay. and the curve is cracking in spots and going down like in a slant, and I didn't know what I need to do to repair that. Then this is your responsibility and not the township's? Yes, I've called several times, and everyone says it's my responsibility to fix it. I just, you know, they say when you sell your home, the curb appeal, and I have yeah. a curb. Is up. <laughs> your, your curb appeal's got to start at the curb, and you keep calling and getting the same answer, so I guess you're kind of stuck with it. Right. Well, listen, there's a couple of things that come to mind. First of all, when you say it's like uh, slanted and sloped, if it's uh, settling, you know, then it's going to have to be torn out. 
If it's just cracked, there's a lot of ways to fix the cracks. Uh, QuickCreate has a number of good products that are designed exactly for that. There is a crack seal. There's a crack repair product that's kind of like caulk. Um, there's also a resurfacing product. So if it's spalled or deteriorated, you can resurface it and it will stick to the old concrete and come out looking uh, quite nice. So there certainly are products to make what you have look better and work better. But if the whole curb is uh, structurally sinking because sometimes water gets under it and that kind of stuff, then that's the case where you'd have to tear it out and have a mason build you a new one. Okay, okay. But the, that, that QuickCrete is pretty easy to do. Absolutely, yes. Take a look at QuickCrete.com. They've got lots of great videos there. They'll walk you through exactly what you need to do. Just search for crack repair. You'll see there's many options depending on the thickness of the crack uh, and what you need to achieve, okay? That is wonderful. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Now I've got Rob in Maryland on the line with a building with a dirt floor, and he needs some help with it. How can we help you? Yeah, hi. I have a 18-foot diameter round space outside. It's a little hut, and I have a dirt floor, and I just want to see if there's some type of a concrete that I can just pour down there or pour on it, and it'll just find its own level. Well, I mean, concrete to some extent finds its own level. You you have access to this space, right? Is there any reason you can't float it out? Yeah, there's. It's easy to, yeah. to do. So then what you're going to want to do is, is is a couple of things. First of all, this is an unheated space? Correct. All right. So so what you want to do is you would, you would want to make sure that the dirt is solidly tamped down, right? And then you're going to add concrete to that to a thickness of at least four inches, but maybe even six. And then float the concrete. It, it takes a little skill. You're going to have to do some research on how to do this. But essentially, when the concrete comes off the truck, there's stone that's embedded in it. And as you spread it out with a, a shovel and a, and a rake, um, you sort of float it. You shake it with a, a float, a trowel. It's like a, like a big trowel. And then the stones sink to the bottom of the concrete, and sort of the cream comes to the top, and that's what gives you that nice finish. And you'll sort of work the concrete smooth and then work your way out the door. So I, I think it's as simple as putting in a concrete slab floor. Is it anything like a dust cover? Yeah, I mean, you can. there's plastic dust covers and things like that. But, I mean, you want a floor that you could actually use. So the concrete is the best way to go. Okay. All right. I mean, you could probably do something with brick pavers, but it would be a lot of work because you'd have to cut all those round edges. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, fall is the perfect season for working outside and taking on some really big planting and patio projects like maybe building a rock garden, a paver patio, a fire pit, laying new sod, or even planting trees. So here are a couple of our favorites to get you started. First, let's talk building a fire pit. This has to be one of the most popular projects ever for this time of year, and it's really not that hard to do. The most important step is picking the right location. You will be aiming for a sweet spot, not too far from your back door, but also not too close to where sparks can fly off the fire and land on your house roof or where the heat can melt your siding, which frankly is surprisingly common. All the years I was a home inspector, Leslie, I'd see that very telltale sort of arched, uh, bent up, shrink, shriveled up, siding, overheated sort of mark on the side of the building. I know that they got their grill or their fire pit too close to that wall. Yeah, just way too close. Now, to build a fire pit, you want to use landscaping stones. And these are large bricks about two to three times as big as a regular brick. And they come in shapes to build either square or round fire pits. Now, to install them, you need to prepare a solid and level base of well-packed gravel. And then you simply stack the big landscape stones on top of each other and let gravity do the rest. Now, another great project for this time of year is to build a rock garden or a water feature. The weather is perfect for this kind of very heavy work. And it's a lot easier to get it done now and only have to add the plants and finishing touches when spring arrives. Now, one part of this project that often gets DIYers tripped up is figuring out the best layout. So here's a trick that we found that can really help, and all you need is some rope. You just use that rope to define the borders of your rock garden or water feature or whatever other element that you want to build. And once you have it down, just look at it. Does it look good? Do you like it? Are you going to use it well? Are you going to enjoy it from every vantage point in the yard? You know, all of those things. And then once you know it works, you got it. Yeah, for example, like if the rock garden is along a path, will there still be enough room to walk by? Or what if you needed to run a lawnmower over the path and the machine fit? You know, if you take time to think through the total layout, Use the little rope trip. You can really make sure the job gets done right and works super well for your space. 
All right, we're going up to Dale in Kansas, who's working on an attic makeover. How can we help you today? Well, I bought this little house, and uh, it's got the Vena Ridge um, down the center of the peak of the roof, and then one two-by-two square opening on the end, uh, and it doesn't seem like that's adequate ventilation to get rid of the heat. So you have no soffit vents at all? You have just have this ridge, you have the ridge vent, the gable vents, and no soffit vents not at the overhang of the roof? And okay. I put a 12-inch uh, turbine vent on it, but I'm thinking I need more than just that two-foot square vent. I was thinking about putting uh, four 12-inch, I don't know what to call them besides the dump vents down towards the lower end of the roof. Okay, well, you're on the right track, so let's talk about attic ventilation and the way it's supposed to work. So the attic is always supposed to be the same temperature as the outside. So if it's hot outside, it should be hot in the attic, and if it's cold outside, it should be cold in the attic. Basically, the attic has to be well ventilated for that to happen. Now, you have actually half of what I usually recommend as a ventilation system, and that's a continuous ridge vent down the peak of the roof. The second half of that, though, are soffit vents at the overhang of the roof. Um, soffit vents are good because as the wind blows across the house, that soffit area pressurizes and, and pushes air up into that soffit. That rides up underneath the roof sheathing where it carts away heat in the summer and moisture in the winter and then exits at the ridge. And that same wind that's pushing positively against the side of the house and the soffit vents is actually creating sort of a negative pressure at the ridge. So you get this kind of nice continuous flow. And if you have that working for you, then actually what you should do is block off those gable vents because that's going to kind of interrupt that nice flow that we've created. Now, in your case, you have no soffit vents. I would first explore the potential of putting in soffit vents. The other idea that you suggested was putting in uh, regular roof vents, but lower on the roof. You know, not a terrible idea, but not nearly as efficient as soffit vents. And if you don't have a soffit, there's a type of vent called a drip edge vent, which basically extends the roof line about two inches, creates a short soffit that's pretty effective. But if you can get continuous soffit and ridge venting, that's really all you need. The other types of ventilators, the turbine that you mentioned, that kind of stuff, you know, it looks like it does a lot, but it's really nowhere near as effective as having that continuous open ridge and the continuous open soffit, okay? I've never seen them. I'm not familiar with that. Uh... Drip edge vent? Google drip edge vent, and I think um, CertainTeed, I know CertainTeed makes it, and I'm sure others do as well. Uh, and it's a really effective little vent. Now, you may have to do some modifications of your roof shingles at the overhang to get this in. But considering you're going to have to modify your roof anyway to put those uh, roof vents in, I think that's probably the best way to go for homes that don't have a soffit because it does create that intake point down low on the roof, uh, which is going to really let a lot of air in, and I think you'll see a big difference. Okay, thanks. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Max, the one to watch for epic original series. Blockbuster movies. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Plus, we have breaking news. 24-7 live streaming news with CNN Max. And live sports with hundreds of games from the NBA, MLB postseason, NHL, NCAA Men's March Madness, and U.S. National Soccer. All included for a limited time with Bleacher Report Sports add-on. After the promo period, add Bleacher Report Sports starting at $9.99 a month. Base subscription required. Well, most burglaries involve criminals forcibly entering into your home, according to the FBI statistics, and that includes coming through your front door. But even if you're diligent about locking up, you do need a good deadbolt to thwart those thieves. Well, Consumer Reports has been rigorously testing and evaluating door locks for years, and they've released some new ratings of the best and worst ones you can buy. With us to share what they found is Dan Roklowski. Dan is the home appliances reporter for Consumer Reports. Welcome, Dan. Hi, thanks for having me. So you found that many of the deadbolt locks tested lacked a certain level of protection that you might want to expect when you're trying to secure your house. So tell us what you found and how you went about testing these things. Sure. So we conduct uh, three what we call brute force tests. So that includes uh, kick-ins where we actually have a custom jig with a 100-pound steel battering ram that we swing into a door that is outfitted with each deadbolt. Oh, come on. That's, that's got to be fun, right? I mean, that's got to be the most enjoyable part of the test. Brute it, force it is, testing. It is very entertaining to watch, <laughs> I will say. 
so yes, we do that. We we raise the height of that battering ram every time, basically, until we get the door to break. Um, and basically, the longer a deadbolt can withstand that battering ram, the better it does in that test. That's probably the most interesting one of the bunch. The other two we do are a drilling test where we use a cordless drill and just try to drill through the deadbolt. The last test we do is just a lock picking test where we actually take the lock apart and look at how it's constructed internally and see how easily a thief could pick it based on its design. So with the brute force testing, how do you determine whether the failure is the lock or the door? Because it would seem to me that with most chickens, given the fact that most people don't really understand the right way to install a lock and they don't use long enough screws and it really is just you know going into the jam and, and nothing much else So I would think that the door jam itself would break before the metal deadbolt would. Do you do you deal with that issue? Yes, that's correct. So what what we really look at is whether a lock comes with a better strike plate. We encourage manufacturers to ship all of their locks with a strike plate that comes with three inch long screws so that you can really, you know, get it deep into the door frame and that way you won't have that issue. Because you're you're absolutely right. The the frame will give way before the lock itself. But all locks do come with a strike plate and we just, you know, really want to see all of them come with a a good box strike plate uh with those long screws. Now what about a keypad lock? I mean it, it's the same sort of system internally, right? It's just your mechanism of opening is different. Does that change the security features at all? I mean, it does change what features are available to you, but our testing is still the same. Um, So we look at both electronic keypad locks as well as your smart keypad locks and models that connect to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or or some other wireless technology. Um, And so we do the same, you know, uh, brute force tests on all of those locks, but also evaluate the features that they have, you know, how easy are they to set up and get connected? How easy are they to control remotely? Do they have any other security features like a tamper alarm if someone is trying to, you know, kick in the door or drill through it? So there's a a number of things outside of the brute force test that we look at for those models. You know, we learned some time ago, uh, we actually did a video on this to teach people how to install a door or how to install one of these, these keypad locks because if the door is not perfectly hung, if it doesn't close properly and everything doesn't line up and you get sort of like rubbing from the deadbolt and that sort of thing, it tends to wear out the battery life. And so in this video, we pretty much showed people exactly how to, how to adjust the door and how to make sure it was working properly. Because otherwise, you would, you would run out of power pretty quickly, and that's a whole other set of issues that come up, especially when you have an electronic lock. You're absolutely right, yeah. It really can put a lot of extra unnecessary strain on the motor um, and, yeah, really cause your battery life to suffer. We, you know, also try to really encourage people to make sure they're installed properly, that the lock bolt is gliding in smoothly into that strike plate and just, you know, making sure it it works right so that you don't run into those issues. So we're talking to Dan Roklowski. He is the home and appliances reporter for Consumer Reports. So, Dan, you did all these tests. What were the ratings? What were the best and the worst models? Sure. So the best locks in our ratings right now are, if you're looking for just a standard deadbolt, the Yale Premier single cylinder YH82. Um, if you're looking for a high security door lock, and what's great about these is they pretty much all withstand drilling attacks from a cordless drill. The best model there is the Medco Maxim 11TR503. And if you're interested in a electronic lock, We really like the Schlage Touch Keyless FE375CAM. And which ones uh, perform poorly and should be avoided? So there are a lot of them, (laughs) but uh, I I can give you... I can give you the worst offenders. All right, go right ahead. Some of the the absolute worst that we've seen are uh, Mylox. There's a a few models from them, but um, one to look out for, it's actually a a smart lock, is this Mylox BLEF02SN. Basically, it it can't protect you in any brute force, you know, (laughs) attack, drilling, picking, or, or being kicked in. If you're looking at electronic locks, do not get the Sherlock. DK201MD15, 
also highly susceptible to drilling, picking, and kick-ins. And as just regular deadbolts go, you'll want to avoid the Yale Edge series, YR82EB. It just goes to show you got to really be careful. Even within the same brand, you know, one deadbolt can do fantastic in these tests and the other just fails. Yeah, I think that was interesting. Yale was in the top of the best locks and also had one on the bottom. So you're right. You can't just go by brand. So, And that's why you guys are so specific about the uh, the locks that you test and you give us the model numbers because they do change, right? And you got to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. You know, these companies will make slight tweaks to the hardware here and there. So you really want to want to pay attention to that unique model number. Dan Rokrowski, thank you so much for stopping by the money. But very interesting story and interesting project testing these locks. If you'd like to learn more, go to consumerreports.org. Sign up for a membership. I tell you what, I can't tell you how many times I go to Consumer Reports when I'm looking to buy a product and get their report on what their testing found. It's great independent expert advice. Dan, thanks for what you do, and thanks again for stopping by the Money Pit. Thank you for having me. Audrey in South Dakota, you've got the money pit. What can we do for you today? All right. Um, I was listening to your show last weekend, and I heard you talking about some kind of like contact paper, but you put it on your like your kitchen wall, and you can put tile on it for a backsplash. Yeah, that's a product called Bondera Tile Matte Set. Kind of a long name, but basically it's a two-sided adhesive sticky material that if you want to do a backsplash or for that matter a countertop, you pull off the uh, backing on one side of it, press it against the wall in your case for the backsplash. Then you can stick the tiles right to the other side of it, pull off the backing on the other side, and you stick the tiles right on. And then you can pretty much grout immediately thereafter so you don't have to wait for glue to dry or even mix up glue or, 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 or get a, a tile glue that can kind of get all over the place. It's all on the mat. So you cut it to fit, put it on the wall, pull off the back, uh, and then go ahead and... Uh, glue the tile right to it. I would caution you, though, that I I would not recommend you put this right on drywall because it's going to be a permanent. (laughs) You're never going to get it off. And if you ever want to replace it, you have to cut the wall out because it'll just pull the paper right off. And what you could do is just put a thin sheet of uh, Lawan plywood on the wall first and then put the tile right on that. Okay. All right. Thank thank you very much. Good luck. Thanks so much for calling us at 888-MONEYPIT. Well, if you love the classic look of marble tops in your kitchen or your bathroom, but not the expense, Dice Coatings is out now with a new product called the Marble Dream Resurfacing Kit that lets you create a beautiful marble surface in just a weekend. Yeah, it's a roll-on marble resurfacing kit that's so great for countertops, vanities, even tabletops. It comes in four elegant color schemes and even lets you create a real marble veined surface in just a few simple steps with no special skills needed. Now, you can create a tough, resilient marble surface with distinct, defined veins, or you can create one that has those soft, swirly veins. They are two very different looks, and you definitely have one that you prefer. So once you start doing your research, you're going to know exactly. It's really easy to use, no skills are needed, and everything that you need is included in the kit for just $169. And you'll find that Marble Dreamer Surfacing Kit at DiceCoatings.com. That's Dice, D-A-I-C-H, Coatings.com. Heading to North Carolina, where Steve's on the line with a window question. What's going on at your money pit? Hi. Um, I have a 30-year-old home where I put uh, vinyl replacement windows in. And here in North Carolina, of course, we have very uh, hot and humid nights. And one thing I noticed in the mornings, uh, that there would be condensation around, um, well, you know, it's got the, the cross pieces in the panes of glass are internal, not external. But I would notice some condensation like around those and around the edges. And even some mornings they were, um, one, but it's a tri-level house, and the, the downstairs is on a concrete slab, and even some of those windows are completely uh, kind of covered with condensation. I just wondered, is that normal, or is there something wrong with the installation? So it's not normal, Steve. What you're seeing is the result of a lack of efficiency of either the glass or the window frames themselves. What's happening here is the cool that you're generating inside the house, that air-conditioned air is basically chilling the windows themselves. And then when the warm, moist air on the outside of your house strikes them, it condenses. Because if you think about it, as you cool 
the air, it releases the water. The same thing happens when you walk outside with a glass of iced tea and you get water that forms on the outside of it. It's because of the condensation. It's because it's the warm air striking it. So it does point to a potential inefficiency of the windows. Now, because the moisture is forming on the outside and not on the inside, you, know, you don't have to worry about leaks and damage, but I don't think you should be seeing as much as you are. And it does speak to an issue that's potentially wrong with the windows themselves. Okay. Um, I guess the, you know, if I contact the uh, manufacturer, because they, they are argon gas, I believe, the manufacturer, um, is that who I would contact or the installer? or? So if the windows are covered by a warranty, I certainly would reach out to the manufacturer as well as the installer. I would reach out to both of them and, and raise the issue, explain it very clearly, send some photographs if you can. And uh, see if they're willing to do something about it, because I, I sense that the windows are not insulated very well, because that should not be happening. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your help. All right. Mario reached out to Team Money Pit. He lives in New Jersey and recently installed replacement windows himself. He says, I left the storm windows in place because I like that extra layer of protection, but I wonder if there's a downside to doing that. You know, I don't really think there's a downside to do it. I mean, it's another layer of glass you're going to have to clean. Uh, you may find that you get some condensation on the back side of that, depending on how the temperature swing is between one side of the glass and the other, which you'd not get with the replacement window because that's insulated glass and it's sealed. I don't really feel like it's a bad thing you did. It's just inconvenient and kind of, uh, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose of replacing the window. So go ahead and live with it now. But if you decide ultimately to take them out, I wouldn't worry too much about it. And I wonder how that looks. Like, does it look okay with an old storm window? Like, does that do anything to the frame or the trim? Yeah, that's a good question. It's going to look a little funky. It's not going to look like brand new windows, you know. It's going to look like something is off. Sometimes you can look at stuff and, and pick up some, um, some like, alternative to the normal installation. Like, I see that a lot when you look at electrical panels and something's just not quite right. And you dig in, like, ah, yeah, I know what they did. They put the black where the white should have been or whatever the heck it was. So, yeah, I think it's not. They're definitely not the right way to do it, but for the most part, I don't see it causing any harm. All right. Good luck with that project, Mario, and good luck with those new windows. Well, if you're planning to sell your house anytime soon, one of the best opportunities to get a qualified buyer happens during the open house. You know, that's when you get to invite hordes of strangers to poke around every nook and cranny of your personal space. Well, Leslie has tips on how to survive the invasion and get your house ready to sell in today's edition of Leslie's Last Word. Leslie? Ugh, yes, the open house is like my worst nightmare. <laughs> it's like painful. They're coming in, they're looking at everything, they're touching things. You know, it's like I love to go look at houses and we'll go to open houses often. And my kids are always like, does it come with this piece of furniture? Can I touch that? I'm like, it's not yours. Don't touch it. Don't open it. And so I know other people would be doing that at my house. But you got to make sure that your house is ready to be seen so you can kind of relax and enjoy the process. So first of all, a buyer needs to really be able to envision their own life in that house. How are they going to live in the space? So clear the clutter. That is definitely something you want to do. And it also opens up the room. So definitely think about removing anything larger or extra pieces of furniture. Just show people that there's a lot of space, you know, space that's there that you forgot about, which is why you're moving in the first place. Now, buyers aren't going to notice if your home is spotlessly clean, but they are going to notice if it isn't. So hire a cleaning service, help make it sparkle. You can even have them just do it once before the first set of open houses, and then you can kind of just maintain it for the next upcoming ones. Now, odors, super important. Nobody wants to buy a house that smells like your pets, or if you're a smoker, nobody likes a stinky house. So you can neutralize those odors by scrubbing the walls, shampooing the carpets, keeping your litter boxes clean. Think about also beautiful finishing touches in the house. New towels in the bathroom, a beautifully set dining table. These things kind of make an impression. Outside, trim the lawn, weed the landscaping, prune the shrubs. And once the day of the open house shows up, guys, leave. Don't stick around. Nothing makes buyers more uncomfortable than if the owner is there. They're going to feel more excited. They're going to show more interest. They're going to ask more questions. It really is great. Make sure your realtor knows all the awesome features and a great standouts of the home. This way they can really speak comfortably about your house and you don't have to be there. Trust me, you don't want to see the people walking all around your space. <laughs> mm -mm. That is so true. I say the same thing about home inspection. Get out. Get you out. Can't. <laughs> 
This is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. Coming up next time on the program, fall is an amazing season for beautiful colors and lots of fun activities, but it's also the start of fire season. We'll highlight fire prevention risks you haven't thought of and give you tips to eliminate them on the next edition of the Money Pit. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. Remember, you can do it yourself. But you don't have to do it alone. It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at PenFed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers' funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. At Granger, we're for the ones who pay attention to every little detail. The ones who fuss, tinker, and sweat the small stuff. Because you know the tiniest thing can make the biggest difference when it comes to keeping business moving. We get it. We're the same way. Offering access to product experts to help you quickly and easily find what you need. So whatever your industry, you know you're always getting professional-grade products. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.